Okay. Um, today we're going to look at chapter 12. So we, uh, there are other sections in chapter 11 for particular types of bearings, like roller contact bearings, that we uh, just aren't going to go over. We looked at the ball bearing types, and then the other bearing types are similar. Um, they have similar rules and similar equations. Um, so we're going to go straight into chapter 12 now, which is journals and journal bearings. Um, so the first thing is we kind of figure out what they are and what they look like. They are, as far as construction goes, simpler in that they have less moving parts than a roller contact bearing because there's basically two parts. Sometimes there's three or four, uh, depending on how the bushing is made. But I've got some pictures because um, I don't have one. I don't have a journal bearing easy to show you, so I've got to have pictures for this one. Um, so here, this is kind of a, a generic form um, where you've got the, the shaft here in silver. That is the journal. So the journal is the part of the shaft. It's very highly polished usually, um, and it is the rotating part. Um, the bearing part of it uh, is this bushing around the outside of it. So I've got some other pictures later. This one's not as easy to pick up because the whole thing's green, but this, this part, oh, you can kind of see it over here. It's kind of, usually it's an insert. Um, it doesn't have to be. It could just be a hole that the shaft is um, in, but uh, a lot of times there's a, a lining of some sort, like a softer material. Uh, a lot of times it's called a bushing. Um, you can kind of see that what they've got here uh, is this part that the hole, obviously this is a cutaway, so this would be completely surrounding it. Um, here are some, like if you've ever taken apart an engine, uh, here are some that you might have seen before. Here's the bottom end of an engine. Uh, uh, internal combustion engine. So here you've got the crankshaft. Um, on it, there are these surfaces that are uh, the journals. So not the entire crankshaft, uh, but just surfaces on it. Um, and then these bearings, these half circles, there's another matching set up here. Um, together, like this one on top and this one on bottom would create one bearing. Um, and so these inserts, they go in this bearing cap, and then they go in here in the um, engine block. And they are the surfaces where um, the journal will sit, except that they don't actually touch when it's in operation. So the whole idea with a journal bearing is that the journal and the bushing don't ever actually touch one another. There's some kind of fluid, usually some kind of oil, uh, between the two of them. And... Um, it's that oil that's actually doing the, you know, the um, friction reduction between the journal and the bearing cap or whatever bushing, whatever you have in there. Um, you can kind of see the end of it. Here's this little lighter colored metal. Um, that's the bushing in this case, or the bearing in this case. Um, and then the polished shiny part, that's the journal. Um, and so the, and you can kind of see there's a little groove inside here in the bearing. Um, that's so that oil can flow around. Um, these bearings are usually softer material than whatever the journal is. The journal is usually hardened, polished. Um, you don't want any um, imperfections in that surface because that will disrupt the flow of the fluid around the, um, uh, bet well, between the journal and the uh, bearing. So uh, notice there's a super tiny tolerance, like thousands of an inch between the journal and the bearing. And that's so that you have this thin film of lubricant. Um, now, when we draw pictures of it, we're going to draw it much larger just so that you can see what's going on. Um, today probably won't be a terribly long uh, talk because we're going to go through kind of the introduction to where um, you take over with mostly empirical uh, charts, reading numbers off of charts and everything. So we're going to get to the point of being able to look at the charts for the next time. Um, but um, we're going to go through, a, um, I guess a, you'd call it a derivation, at least an exploration of what's called Petrov's equation. Now this equation has a major flaw in it um, at the very beginning of what the assumptions are to derive Petrov's equation. But um, it does produce um, these dimensionless quantities later on in the equation that do get used. Um, but the equation itself, you don't really use it anymore for um, a analysis of a journal or a bearing. Um, but it does produce these dimensionless quantities. 
Um, so let's start with, um, now that we kind of have an idea that there's a journal that's a shaft and a bushing that's the hole that that shaft rides in. Um, let's start with that idea and I'm going to go over and kind of draw some pictures of what we might look at. So let's let's say that uh, the journal, well let's start with the let's start with the hole so the bushing something like this. So and and this is stationary so we're going to lock it in place with our little lines here. Now I said that Petrov's equation has a major flaw and here here it is. Um, let's draw the end so I'm drawing kind of an end view so that we can label things and look at different pictures. Um, so let's draw where the journal is. Now again I'm going to draw really the clearances are super tiny but I have to draw them larger so that you can uh, begin to see any of it. So here let's this will be well let's do the next size. No let's do this one. So look at this circle. In reality the journal kind of rides over to the side and down you know assuming that the force is pushing it down. Um, Petrov's equation doesn't do that because what that does is that makes a really tight clearance on one side and a much larger clearance on the other side. Um, but Petrov's equation just centers it. So, you know, it kind of does like that where the journal is right in the center of the uh, bushing, well, of the bushing or the hole that it's riding in. Um, so that's the major flaw. And again, these, these clearances are tiny, so you wouldn't think it makes that big a difference, except that um, the fluid in here, uh, the oil or the lubricant, um, is it's not pressurized because there's a pump feeding it in. Sometimes there are pumps that do feed fluid lubricant into the journal area, but um, it's pressurized because of the spinning of the journal. And we'll look at that later. Um, there will be some charts that we can look at to see that pressure level. Um, and so it, when it gets really tight clearances over here, you end up with the potential for this becoming just a few molecules of lubricant thick. Um, and if that happens, then uh, you're going to get heat in that area increase, which heat generally reduces viscosity, which makes it thinner, the lubricant thinner, which makes it worse and it gets closer and closer and closer. And eventually you get the journal colliding with the bushing and then it's pretty much all over at that point. Um, and so there is a high pressure in this fluid um, and the closer this thing gets, it just uh, exasperates that problem. Um, but Petrov doesn't consider that. Maybe he didn't know or he just getting a first approach at it. Um, and what happens there is you end up with this scenario. And so I'm trying to center the red circle is the journal. It, that's pretty well centered. Um, and so this is what we're going to look at. And um, again, it's not going to derive an equation that we'll use, but it's going to derive parameters that we'll use um, in charts and tables later on, mainly charts. Um, so this journal has some kind of its own weight for one thing. I'm going to put a center of gravity here with an arrow. So it has its own weight and you know last time when we did bearings, roller contact bearings, uh, there was a radial force so that's combined in here that has to be supported. Um, so there's all kinds of forces. I'm just going to show them going straight down in this scenario. Um, but you know, it doesn't, we can orient this however we want to. Um, it's spinning at some speed. Now, um, we normally don't deal with this speed in radians per second, so it's not normally um, omega. Normally we use n because uh, normally this is going to be in some kind of revolutions per time, so RPM a lot of times, sometimes hertz, I guess, revolutions per second. Um, but a lot of times it's going to be RPM. So, um, so instead of using omega for the angular speed velocity here, there'll be a capital N, N a lot of times. Um, now what we're going to do to get to Petrov's equation, and, and this gap in here, I don't really have a, maybe we can do this. This is kind of fluid oil, very bright oil color, I guess. I don't even know what that looks like on camera, but... So this thing's all filled with whatever our lubricant is in here. It's a very bright color. Um, and this shaft is spinning, bushing is staying in place. <clears throat> now we need to take 
a super tiny section. So like a tiny little section down here and blow that up bigger so that we can see um, what's going on. And if we take a small enough section down here, then I'm not gonna have to worry about the curvature of the shaft, the journal or the bushing. And so I'm just gonna draw it as a flat. So this might be the journal And then down here, this guy would be the bushing. All right, and in between them is our lubricant. So I'm not gonna color that whole thing in, but in here is the, you know, the lubricants inside there. And again, Petrov assumes that this clearance, I will label that, Usually the letter C is for clearance. That clearance stays the same all the way around the journal. Oh, let's get that on the picture. Um, so um, that's not true. So the clearance is tighter in one area and larger in another area. Um, but all of the what we'll do and look at today assumes this clearance stays consistent all the way around. Um, it is going to be labeled C, though, so that is what we will keep. Um, so if this thing is spinning, then there's some force, you know, F, that is creating the journal spinning around. Um, that force is, you know, maybe right here. Force times the radius is a torque. Normally we talk about the torque causing the rotation. Um, but if you have a force at a radius, that creates the torque. So this force is that one that uh, uh, is related to that torque in the shaft. Okay. Um, and in the fluid, the bushing isn't moving. So in this case, the journal is the part moving and the bushing is stationary. I don't know that you ever have it the other way around um, in, in a scenario like this. Maybe there, I could think of something like that, but right off the top of my head, I don't think of anything like that. Um, so what we assume and what Petrov's equation assumes, and it's generally true, is that um, at the surface of the bushing, the velocity of the fluid, uh, the lubricant, is zero. And at the surface of the journal, the journal is spinning, the velocity of the fluid is spinning at the same speed as the journal. And then there's a linear relationship between there. So you might have a profile velocity speed profile that is some kind of linear relationship. Now this linear relationship is true as long as this is a Newtonian type fluid. If you get some non-Newtonian fluid, then this is not linear, but um, our lubricants are gonna be more like this. Um, we're gonna call this U. U is gonna be that linear velocity headed out this way. So this will be, you know, U equals whatever the maximum is, you know, the surface speed of that journal. And here, u is going to equal zero, and it's just a linear line between there. So <clears throat> from other sources, you could figure out that the shear, so this tau is going to be the shear in the fluid, in the lubricant, is equal to, now you got to be careful. I'm going to try and draw these neat enough that you can tell the, them apart, but this is going to be the viscosity, so mu, the viscosity times du, so that's the velocity, dy. We didn't put y on here, but y is just the direction from the bushing to the journal. All right. Um, so that's the um, pieces of information that we'll keep going back to as we develop Petrov's equation. Um, so let's see. Let's let's start getting into Petrov's equation um, from this one. So we'll start here with just a generic shear in the fluid is viscosity times that velocity profile. And we are assuming that it is a linear velocity profile. All right, we'll have to keep this probably nearby because we're probably gonna need it a couple of times. Maybe not, I don't know. <clears throat> All right, so if we're dealing with tau, 
in general, we know that tau is a force over the area that that force is acting on. I guess we do need this. There's the force, and the area is the entire area of the um, journal. So it's this perimeter, circumference, times however deep that journal is. Actually, it's not necessarily how deep the journal is. A lot of times it's controlled by the bushing. So the bushing has the one depth that's usually smaller, a little bit smaller than the journal. So it's normally the, the length into the paper here is controlled by how uh, long the bushing is. So let's knowing that, let's put some values into our force. Well, force we just call it F. We'll get to that later. But for now, it's just the force that's related to the torque uh, in the shaft. Um, but let's work on the area. So the area in this equation would equal, um, I guess I need a variable over here. Let's make the radius just R. That makes sense. So radius of the journal is R. So our area here would be 2, well, I already wrote pi. So pi times 2R. So that's pi D, basically. So that's the circumference of the red circle here. Um, and then we want the um, area. So that's just a multiply times L, where L is the length of, and it's usually the length of the bushing, but it's the length of the overlap between um, the journal and the bushing, which is usually controlled by the length of the bushing. So it's the distance into the page here. So now we have a little bit of a modified equation, I suppose. Um, we could go in and say that, um, well, we let's, let's copy down this one because that's where we started. And this is, again, viscosity, velocity. So that's where we started. Um, but we know that these are equal. They're both shear stresses, just different ways to express it. Um, let's go in and um, let's plug in this guy. So F over um, 2 pi R L. So I, I just, I don't know why I want the 2 in front. I just like the 2 in front more than starting with pi for some reason. Um, and that's going to equal, uh, we basically have mu. Um, now this du over dy, since it is linear, that's just the maximum. We can replace that with just u. Um, as far as, or, well, we can replace it with, it's the slope, right? du, dy is the slope of this line, which is just u. I'm, I'm not going to write u max. U ma I'm just going to use u as the uh, maximum variable. And so u over c. So basically the slope of that line. So equals mu. I'm going to replace du, dy with just that velocity at the journal over the clearance. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, scale this thing uh, in relation to how big is the journal. So basically, I'm just going to multiply both sides by R. So I'm going to take this side, multiply by R, take this side, multiply by R. So I haven't really done anything to the equation. It just helps later on um, as I'm deriving this. You'll, a lot of times, you'll see little uh, things like this where um, you multiply both sides by the same number, and that's uh, for one reason or another. In here, what the reason is, is that now we have force times radius on this side, which is that force times that radius, which we can replace with torque. And now we're relating back to the torque. So that's, that's one of the reasons I want to do it here. And it doesn't actually change the equation because I multiplied both sides. I scaled both sides by that radius. So I didn't change anything about the way the equation works. Um, okay, let's see. Let's work on this U. So this is that linear velocity. Um, so it's the linear velocity right here. And we said that the fluid, the lubricant, is traveling when it's touching the journal at the same speed that the journal's traveling. The only thing we know about the journal speed is N, 
So it's going some revolutions per minute or cycles per second or whatever. So we just called it N. Um, I'm going to assume M for now. I'm going to assume M uh, or N. I keep saying M. N is RPM. So what I can do there is if it were just a straight line, which I've actually kind of simplified it to by narrowing it down to such a tiny little gap. You know, in reality, this journal is curved and this bushing, you know, they're both curved uh, in reality. But I'm looking at such a small area that they more or less look flat. Um, but if it was flat to calculate speed, it would just be distance over time, right? So I'm going to do a similar thing here, except the distance is going to be around the circle of the journal. So that's 2 pi r. So I'm going to go in and say that this velocity, so this is not mu, this is the velocity u, um, is 2 pi r. But then um, I need to, that's just a distance, right? So distance per speed, if I multiply times n, then that gets the per minute part into it. So it defines how big a revolution is, and then n has per minute in it. So I have this distance per minute. So I'm going to put this in, 2 pi r n, into, I'm going to substitute it in for u. And so then we'll have, I'm going to go ahead and put f times r over here, 2 pi r l equals viscosity. u is now going to be 2 pi r n. Uh, I still have the C in there, that's the clearance, and I still have this R that I multiplied by. Got some miscellaneous marks there. Um, now what I can do is I can go back over here. I've got F times R. I, I'm going to do what I said I was going to do at the very beginning of this little part where F times that radius R is the torque that's turning the shaft or that the shaft is delivering, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, so I'm just going to put FR is T. And there's the viscosity. I'm going to leave all this the same. Okay. <clears throat> now we're missing something that seems pretty important. Um, I wish I could ask y'all questions of what do you think is missing, but I'll just answer myself. Um, we don't have anything talking about the friction. That's the whole point. You know, we're trying to reduce the friction between the journal and the bushing by making them not touch one another, but that doesn't mean that it's frictionless. Like if, if you spun this thing up, it would eventually stop if you didn't keep adding power into it. So there's friction in there somewhere um, inside the fluid. Um, we don't want friction between the journal and the bushing because that means they're touching one another and then that is going to grind to a halt very quickly. So we don't want that. So we have to account for the friction somehow. So we're going to use this. F, that's going to be my coefficient of friction. And we're going to take the generic definition of friction. So normally how you define friction in a now remember it's unitless, so how you talk about it is that it is a tangential force divided by a normal force. So we've got to come up with our tangential forces and our normal forces. <clears throat> so we already have the tangential force. We defined it as this F. Um, we currently have it, you know, embedded in the torque T. So um, we can temporarily unembed it. Remember, torque equals force times radius. And so therefore, F equals torque divided by radius. So we can take that and there, that T over R is the tangential force. So there's our tangential force. And then our normal force... I just put that as W. So that accounts for uh, the weight of the shaft that this journal is part of. It accounts for any radial forces on the shaft that need to be supported. Maybe it's a, um, 
crankshaft and the engine and there's all these pistons that are have mass and they're pushing on it and they're pulling on it and all this kind of stuff so we're just going to lump all of that into what i call w and it is not always going to point straight down it's going to be some resultant at whatever angle but um it's simplest to think of it as just going straight down um, and so i'm just going to put w as our normal force <clears throat> so if i can solve this so therefore torque which i do have in this equation but i'm going to redefine it as torque equals that friction now i've got friction in the equation times w times r so all this is is solving this equation for t torque um, now what i need to do is um, a couple of things all right let's we ran out of paper so let's get us a new sheet of paper All right, let's see, where do I wanna go? Let's, I think I wanna take this equation so that we don't skip too many steps. Um, so hold this temporarily, but let's go back to this equation and let's solve it for T. So just, so basically just multiply this side by two pi R L. So that will give us, let's see if I can get everything on the same screen. So here I'm solving this equation for T. T equals still um, mu will be in there somewhere and then I've got 2 pi R there's a 2 pi R and actually there's another R over here so I've got um, and there's a 2 so I've got 2 times 2 we'll put the 4 out front mu is out there um, pi squared R cubed L in over C so pi squared R cubed L in over the clearance C. So I've got that. All right, now we can, now we also know that torque, let's see if I can get that to show up. We just discovered that torque is also expressed as the friction times the weight or this radial force that has to be supported by the fluid um, times R. So I'm gonna take FWR, plug in here. So frequent, uh, not frequency. <laughs> friction coefficient of friction w r equals all this stuff so all of this this derivation is legitimate it just started out with a bad assumption so it just started out with assuming that this fluid stays evenly spaced all the way around the journal and that's the problem with this um, derivation all of the the mathematics and the theory and all that other than the centering the concentric nature of the shaft all of that's okay it's just that this is not actually concentric when you're in practice um, but now we've got this equation and we're almost actually we're, we're really close to to being done um, one of the things though that we have to consider is <clears throat> this fluid is under pressure somehow um now it turns out that it's under much more pressure than was originally thought so originally um they just kind of you know maybe they they could envision that the uh weight you know the force this w uh created some pressure in the fluid and and maybe it does a little but the real pressure comes from spinning the uh shaft um, that's not the pressure we're going to look at here. We're going to look at the, the pressure that has to, we're just going to assume that this fluid has to hold up the journal. So in our picture, basically, we're going to say that, you know, this fluid is basically supporting the, the journal. Um, now that pressure, you know, it's all distributed at different angles and it's not evenly distributed and everything. Um, what we're going to do is, if you remember bearing stress from whenever you first did mechanics and materials, you used a projected area to do a similar thing when you had a bolt that was in a hole or a pin inside a hole. You, you calculated a projected area of that bolt onto the hole. We're going to do a similar thing here. I'll try and draw sort of a picture for us. Um, this might be... This might be the journal. So there's the circle that is the red line. 
would be this circle here. And um, I'm going to project the area of the fluid. So when I project it, I'm going to have to project it down lower so it doesn't all run together. But it's just a rectangle. And this distance is the diameter. So I'm going to write that as 2r because I don't want to introduce a new variable. So I'm going to write 2r instead of d. Um, and this variable, we've talked about it. Um, this is the one we've been using as L. And <clears throat> the pressure is on this surface. Now we're assuming it's all even and nice and everything. We know it's not. But um, we're going to just say that this is the pressure that the fluid has to exert on the journal to hold it up and not let it touch the bushing. So we're going to call that P. So that's the pressure. Um, and remember we had, I want to put it in the center here, we had this net force pushing down, which we called W. It's not just the weight of the journal, but um, we called it W. And so these have to balance. Otherwise, if these don't balance, then if W is too big compared to P, then the journal crashes into the um, bushing beneath it. If P is too large, then um, it will shoot the journal up into the top of the bushing. So they have to balance. So basically, if we think of this as the y direction, we have a summation of forces in the y direction. Uh, w is already a force. P is not, though. Uh, P is a pressure. So um, if we want to figure out the force that uh, P is associated with, P is that force. Well, let's not use F. Let's call it F sub P, so because we already have an F. It's not the F that we've been using over here. It's not that F. So that's why I'm calling it F P. Over area, uh, we'll call that area P also, because we are we have an area somewhere previously that was a different area. Um, so this F P is just the force that we're talking about here, and area is this area two R times L. So now I've got F P over 2RL. Um, and these, this W has to balance with this FP. Oh, well, I guess I could solve for FP. FP equals um, P times 2RL. All right. So now I've got uh, this force that's associated with this distributed pressure in the fluid. Um, I've got it spelled out in terms of P and the area that it's acting on. And again, this area is the projected area of the um, journal. Okay. Um, and we said that this had to balance with W. So W has to equal that force. So that means it has to equal P times 2 times R times L. And we have a W in our equation, right? So we're going to take P2RL, plug in to where we left off with our derivation of Petroff's equation, and now we'll have friction, F. W is now P2RL. Uh, there's another R there. Equals, we didn't change anything on this side, so 4 mu pi squared R cubed L N over C. All right, so this is where we're at now. And all we need to do now is we have a lot of terms that are similar. We have uh, some constants, 4 and 2. Uh, we have R, R, there's R cubed, so we have R scattered around in there. Um, and we're going to collect some terms and solve for F, this friction. So basically, I'm just going to take all of this side and move over there and then collect like terms. And I'm gonna write them in a particular direction. Two, so that's four over two. Um, I think we have a pi squared in there. Yeah, pi squared. Uh, and then we have r cubed here. We're gonna divide out r squared, so we're just left with r. And I'm gonna put the r over c. These two relate to each other, radius over clearance, and they create one of our dimensionless terms r over c. Oh, wow, that's not what I intended to happen. That's okay, though. That's r over c. Um, 
And then I'm left with um, mu is still over here. The L's just divide out, L over L, so um, they cancel out. Um, we have N is still here, so that's the speed. And then we have um, P, pressure. Um, now, this, uh, maybe we'll let it dry for a little bit. This is, it, th these are both actually R over C and mu N over P are both dimensionless groups. So this is one, R over C, that's easy to see because it's just um, radius, which is, uh, you know, inches over clearance, which is inches, although they're tiny. Um, still, those definitely cancel out. But this one also cancels out. It might be harder to see um, with the uh, mu in there, uh, rain, the unit for viscosity a lot of times is equal to a PSI over revolutions per second revolutions per time there's a revolution per time p pressures in psi so all of this does cancel out also maybe we can highlight it now without a lot of trouble well there we go so both of these are dimensionless groups um, and they will show up in things that we'll do shortly um, in fact um, actually, let's talk real quick about a couple of charts in your book, and then that's about as far as we can go today, um, and next time we'll pick up with uh, using these charts. Um, these aren't the ones we want. These are actually just showing some uh, viscosities at different temperatures for uh, oils of different types. Um, no More viscosity. Let's see, where's one of the ones that's interesting? Here we go, all right. Well, that's not the one I actually want. It, it would, here we go, this one actually will be better. Um, so this has the coefficient of friction variable. I don't know if y'all can read that, let's zoom in. Maybe that would help. Let's see, yeah, you can see it. All right, so over here, coefficient of friction variable, you've got R over C times F, so, Let's start a new page, copy our equation down here. All right, so our equation that we're, we're Petroff's equation, I guess I didn't actually tell you this was Petroff's equation. Um, F equals two pi squared R over C times mu N over P. Now in our book though, this is uh, page 631, figure 1218. You want to see that? Um, the y-axis has F times R over C. So if we take and scale this equation with R over C, so that means multiply this side and this side by R over C, then I've got the y-axis as this term over here. F times R over C. And then down here, you've got a term R over C squared mu N over P, which I've got right here. R over C squared, there's R over C times R over C mu N over P. This term is one that's gonna show up a lot. So I'm gonna rewrite it. So this is, um, they have it as R over C times friction equals uh, two pi squared, R over C squared, mu N over P. This term is called the Sommerfeld number, um, S, and it's gonna be a term that will show up in a lot of these graphs. Um, you'll see it as, as the x-axis for many of these graphs. And so basically, and, and they're log log, so um, you can see that uh, it is not an actual linear, well, it's hard to see because it actually looks kind of like a straight line, but this is on log log graph. Um, so it's not a linear relationship between a lot of these variables 
um, which doesn't really sh pop out of some uh, Petrov's equation. But um, so we know that Petrov started out with a little bit wrong piece of information at the very beginning where he assumed this fluid stayed uh, equally distributed across the whole uh, surface of the journal. So there was no tight spot, no wide spot or anything like that. Um, but since there is one of those, then uh, the actual experimental results, and, and th I think you could probably get to some of these results um, mathematically, possibly, um, but most of these are from a, an experimental type approach. Um, they include terms that are out of Sommerfeld, uh, out of, uh, this is Sommerfeld's number, out of Petrov's equation. Um, and so next time what we'll do is we'll go in and we'll use Sommerfeld number um, and we'll use a, a variety of other things to figure out things like, well, what is the, the coefficient of friction variable and the flow rate? So how much uh, is the lubricant flowing? Um, what is the minimum film pressure ratio, the minimum film thickness and all this kind of stuff? Um, and most all of that will be done through some kind of chart. There is one other little chart, not a chart, it's kind of a descriptive plot. I don't see it right now. Oh, here it is. <clears throat> this guy right here. This is figure 12.4 um, on page 615. Uh, and again, it's not a chart that we're going to use for anything, but it does also have that mu n over p. They call it the bearing characteristic. Um, and then they relate the coefficient of friction F. So those are terms, you know, F, there's the bearing characteristic in Petrov's equation. Um, and it does show this um, breakdown point. So over here, uh, on the right side of this dotted line AB, you've got a thick layer. Now thick is still not, you know, inches thick. It's still very tight tolerances, but it's still classified as thick film. It's not individual molecules of oil so it is a thick film um, and it's called stable and then at some point the um, ratio of viscosity to speed over pressure is too small and uh, you end up with what's a called a thin film so in that case you really do have just a few molecules thick of your lubricant so your your journal is getting too close to the bushing um, and as, as the journal gets closer to the bushing, um, the heat that's generated in that lubricant at that uh, very tight tolerance um, or tight gap is, um, it has no way where to dissipate. So the heat keep increases, that decreases the viscosity, which makes the fluid thinner, which makes the gap smaller because uh, it can't support as much of the W that we had before, um, and which makes it worse. So it's a narrower gap. And so it, it escalates into a negative solution or not a negative solution, but a negative process where that's usually where you have, um, viscosity breakdown and your, uh, your journal collides with the bushing that it's housed in. And you got pretty catastrophic, catastrophic failure at that point. Um, on the other side, on the thick film, as things speed up, and uh, viscosity does increase, uh, well, decrease um, again, but now there's enough fluid there to dissipate the heat, um, and it actually is a reinforcing uh, solution. So um, as more heat is put into the fl film or the fluid, uh, the lubricant, then the viscosity decreases a little bit, um, but it's not to the point of, uh, failure like we had over here because over here um, there was so little fluid or film to account for anything that any decrease in viscosity would essentially collapse the the bearing or collapse the fluid between the journal and the bearing. Over here the decrease in vol uh, viscosity um, lets the fluid flow faster because it's thinner you know it's not thick right now um, which actually gets new fluid in there cools it back down it stabilizes and you can even see they say that this side is stable this side is unstable um, so you can use this bearing characteristic now this is obviously not a uh, uh, you know quantif 
quantifiable number on this chart, but we'll look at that. In fact, they do quantify it over here. Um, so they say that this point um, C, where this danger zone happens, is right here. So mu n over P needs to be greater than or equal to 1.7 times 10 to the sixth. Again, it's a dimensionless number. Um, so that's equation A on page 615. Um, and that will give you the breakdown point between the unstable and the stable. All right, so next time we'll actually go in and we'll use these charts. We'll use Sommerfeld number. Um, again, we won't actually use Petroff's equation. It's just a nice, easy way to understand where these dimensionless groups are coming from. Um, and um, we will use the results. You know, we will use RVC. We will use um, Sommerfeld number. Um, and we will, we will use friction times R over C and all the, and that bearing characteristic that we just looked at. They all come from Petroff's equation, just the equation itself doesn't um, give us, you know, things we can calculate. So we can't actually calculate stuff from the equation itself. But these dimensionless groups that are in the equation we do use, we just use charts and figures to figure out, um, you know, the lubrication thickness and heat flow rate, all this kind of stuff. Um, okay, so next time we will go in, use Sommerfeld number, a um, couple other of the bearing characteristics, and calculate uh, how much bearing surface do we need. If we, if we have a bearing that's open and fluid's just flowing out of it, how much fluid do we have to use, put back into it uh, to make sure it never loses fluid? And so we'll calculate stuff like that. Uh, but we'll do that next time. Uh, I think we wouldn't have time to really get into it for today, so we'll call it uh, good for today, and we will pick up again next time. See you later.